السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، الحمد لله رب العالمين. والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم. This is our third lecture out of this course, the revival of knowledge, in which we cover the, the first book of Ihya al din the revival of religious sciences or religious knowledge, and we'll talk about the difference between these two translations in a little bit. So we were covering the first book, the book of knowledge, which is the first book out of the total 40 books of Ihya al din Ihya al din which is the the revival of religious sciences or religious knowledge. We covered last time, the, actually the, the, the past two lectures. The beginning lecture we talked about Imam al-Ghazali, we talked about his biography, his seerah, we talked about his contribution to the Muslim tradition, to scholarship, uh, to Sufism especially. And there is a small correction that I would like to mention that I mentioned that, uh, that will be Imam al-Ghazali or uh, uh, his Imam al-Ghazali I, I said uh, I believe during the first lecture that it's called Dur al-Muslim and Dur al-Muslim is, is a book actually but it's called as sir al-Muslim that's the name of al-Hiz of Imam al-Ghazali so we talked about the first lecture we talked about Imam al-Ghazali himself his character and then we moved on to talk about the, the book itself, in, its, in, in the totality of Ahiyya al din we talk about the, the, the revival of religious sciences as a, as a total encyclopedia. And we talked a little bit about the Book of Knowledge. And then we moved on last time, we talked about the uh, section number one, or the first section of the Book of Knowledge, in which Imam Ghazali who discusses the idea of knowledge, the value of knowledge, the virtue of knowledge, the value of teaching, and the virtues of teaching and learning and so on. So we covered that section uh, in the second lecture. So today, the third lecture, we'll be covering the second section. And, and as I said, the, the book of knowledge is divided into seven sections. And the totality of this, uh, the, this course is comprised of eight weeks, eight lectures. The first lecture, as I said, the biography that we've already covered, and then this, the seven Remaining lectures cover, each lecture covers one section out of the book of knowledge. Okay, I asked you last time that you guys go over the first section and perhaps also go over the second section. So I want to start, if you have any questions about what we said, or what we covered during the, 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 first, the second lecture last time, uh, if you have any questions about the reading, did you guys read? The chapter, the, the, that section. Yes, no. Mm. As I said, what, what we're doing is that we don't cover word by word, so you have a responsibility. Mm. There's a, 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 a task that you guys should be doing. You should be reading the section on your own, because we don't cover that the, the words of the Imam Ghazali word by word, but rather we cover the topics, the notions, the matters that he discusses in the in the section. So you're supposed to be reading. The, the whole section at home before you come. Mm. Okay. So no questions. Fine. All right. Imam al Ghazali has been talking about the value and the virtues of knowledge, and then he moves on to this idea that there are different branches or different or two types of knowledge, so to speak. One of them is a praiseworthy knowledge, and the other is uh, objectionable. Some kind of knowledge that is perhaps rejected. It's not uh, to be claimed as uh, some, something worth your effort, your time, uh, something that should not be acquired. So he did, divides knowledge into two types. Perhaps if you want to really simplify it, it's a good type and a bad type. Good knowledge and a bad knowledge. Perhaps beneficial knowledge and some kind of harmful knowledge that does not uh, lift up the, the person who acquires that type of knowledge. In order for him to do that, he uses this idea of a subwa taqseem that is known in 
the science of logic, uses this kind of division. He, he tackles the idea of knowledge by dividing different sorts, by actually putting some kind of uh, what we call like a, a border. He is saying that the, the, he defines what he means by knowledge in the beginning, and then after he does that definition, he, mentioned, he mentions the different branches and then goes to every single branch and talks about it in its own. Before we begin, I just want to note something. I'm going a, a little bit slowly because there are people still coming. Okay. There is a difference between science and knowledge. Knowledge is one thing and science is another. If, we under, if you understand this division, if you can distinguish between science and knowledge, then the rest of this section should be easy for you. So this is what we'll start by, by asking. Who, who can define science here? What is science? When you say the word science, hmm. and put you know put aside the, the Arabic terms. Don't tell me ilm and ma'rifa. Just put that aside. I'm just talking about. Let, let, let's use the, the English language since we're studying the, the book from the translation, the English translation. So what, what is science? When you say science, what is that? Hmm. Just raise your hand if you have a before instead of calling people. Huh. Go ahead. Study of something. Study of something. But what do you mean by study? Like you study something or? To be, to make some research. Okay, a research of something. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Uh, science, yes sir. Uh, empirical, rational, uh, accumulative. Okay, empirical and rational, all right. And it's accumulative. Accumulative. Okay, very well. You're giving me like keywords. Okay, well, what, what if you wanted to, because uh, you're, these are very good keywords that you're using. If you wanted to put it in a definition, what would you say? Like a science is what? A study, okay. Based on empirical findings, perhaps, okay. Mm. Simply, science is a part of knowledge. Science is a part of knowledge. Then what is knowledge? But I didn't ask that yet. What is science? Huh. Realize. Realize. What do you mean? Realize it. Uh, acknowledge. Okay. To, science is to, to realize something, to understand something. Okay. Mm. It's, it's more about uh, induction. More about induction. Okay. Not deduction. Mm. And it's try to find uh, causal, causal relation. Okay. To understand causal relations like cause and effect. Causal relations, like to understand the different causes and effects, okay? What leads to something, what causes something, all right? Mm. What else? Results and information get it from experimental observation. Okay, so you're, pretty, you're doing like a shock for the definition that he was giving, right? Okay, because you're saying we do experiments and we're getting results out of these uh, examinations that we're doing, okay? So examination is a study. When you guys mean, when you said study, it's an examination. Yes, sir. It's a particular uh, branch of scientific knowledge. But then you would be describing science by science. You know, if you say what is science, and then you say science is scientific. Mm, you, you, you have to change one word here. Okay. But you said scientific what? Scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge. Okay. That is similar. Like when you said earlier, science is part of knowledge. Okay. Science, uh, science is a uh, accumulation of knowledge and has... Is a has combination? Is that what you said? Yes, has okay. systems, systems. Systems. Uh, You're giving me keywords again. Just put it in a, can you put it in a sentence? Is that possible? Hmm. This science is... Uh, I, I can I can help you. You said science is guys, guys please. <coughs> science is again. Uh, same formulation of knowledge. So uh, accumulation uh, or a combination? Which word? Combination. Combination. Okay, you combine. Combine, combine what? Knowledge. knowledge. What do you mean by knowledge? Combining of knowledge of knowledge is. Yeah. What is knowledge though? Like understandings? Uh, social 
there is social science, so that is uh, empirical sciences like chemistry and biology. Okay. Okay. So it's a, some kind of combination of different ideas. That's what you mean. Knowledge. All right. Mm. Uh, something that can be repeated or repetitive. Something that can be repeated. Again and again. So you mean like the, the experiments itself, right? Themselves. Huh? It's some, something that we can repeat it again and again to obtain empirical facts or knowledge. Okay. So I think the spirit of Popper is attending the. You guys know what Popper? Yeah. Philosopher of science. Done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just raise your hand. So. Yes, sir. What is the first word? Art of knowing something. Art of knowing something. Okay. Interesting. You you said something earlier. It has rules and fundamentals. It has rules and fundamentals. Families have rules and fundamentals. Countries have rules and fundamentals. Mm. I think knowledge is general, is more general than science. But we don't know what knowledge is. Huh? We can get knowledge by experience, but science we can't get it by experience. Didn't you say that we get it by experience? What's the difference? Experiment. I could, I could say experiment. Look, guys, I ask questions, but you have to, if you want to speak, just raise your hand. And I don't allow side talks. Even if you're talking to yourself. <laughs> okay, so you said earlier that science is uh, perhaps data or something that we collect by examination, and we do these examination experiments. And then you were saying that knowledge, get, we, we acquire knowledge from experience. So we acquire knowledge from experience, but we acquire science from experiments. So that, then the only difference would be that experiments are experiences that are done in labs. Right? Right? Would you, would you agree? An experiment is just like an experience, but only in a lab, in a, some kind of structure. Okay. Hmm. Ability to produce a uh, solution in some problems. Ability to? Uh, again? Uh, produce. Produce? A solution. Okay. In some problems. Okay, so uh, like problem solving. Okay. Excellent. Mm, not bad. What else? <laughs> okay. Uh, before I, uh, I tackle this idea, I want to tell you two things. Look, when we ask a question like, what is? This is one of the types of questions that are used in sciences. What is, in Arabic, they say, we're asking about al mahiya We're asking about the quiddity of something. In other words, we're asking about definition, okay? Um, I, you guys really bring excellent keywords. Some of you have provided definitions, regardless if it's correct or not. But some of you provided definitions, and others defined, uh, provided keywords. See, keywords, don't, they're, they're interesting, they could be intellectual, but they don't act as a definition. And if I, for, for example, if I ask you, what's a human? Hmm? What's, a, what's a computer, for example? And you tell me, it has a keyboard. Okay, but what is a computer? And then you say, like, look, it has like a CPU, memory, you know, Windows, Linux, whatever, Apple, Macintosh. What? Hmm? You're giving me keywords, but you're not, you're not answering the actual question, like, what is a computer? A computer is da da da. Hmm? So this is something you need to work on. That when you ask to define something, it is important for you, before you define it, to brainstorm the different keywords that perhaps from them, you will articulate some kind of definition. Any one of us ha has to go through this uh, stage of brainstorming different keywords. But then, if you don't move on from this stage, the stage of defining, then th that would be kind of uh, limited mm -hmm. from what is required. 
And you will find how Imam al-Ghazali here talks about, defines things in a, in a clear form. Okay. So, perhaps if I want to uh, summarize what you, have guys, uh, what you guys have said, uh, perhaps and I'll mix up some of the keywords with the definitions. That science is uh, a field of study in which examinations and experiments uh, are used to get out certain results. Sometimes these results are pertaining to different problems, so we're looking for problems. Okay. Um, a science is a field of study that is based on empirical data. In other words, it's based on numbers, quantitative data. Okay, and as you as uh, you said, it's based on deduction. You said induction about this, based on induction, which is istiqra. In other words, you go through different cases in order to extract some kind of holistic, some kind of general conclusion as much as possible. Okay, so we said empirical, we said quantitative data, and it's an area of study. You said that sciences have fundamentals, which is a feature, perhaps, of sciences. But generally speaking, it's a field of study. Okay. Then we come to another question. What is a field of study? <laughs> See, so, so far, uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to problematize the idea. We take this word science, we hear the word science, but we take it for granted. We say, as you were talking, social sciences, but when we come and ask this question, what do you mean by علوم? You mentioned the idea that this, and perhaps also another, your classmate has talked about this idea of accumulation, and you, talk, and you call it combining different ideas together, together right? If we, if I, if I would analyze the, the definitions and the, the keywords that you guys have mentioned, there is these components, the sciences involve these following components. Problems or questions that we're trying to answer or solve. A source of knowledge, and in this case, what you guys have been talking about is empirical, right? Empirical meaning experiments that involve quantitative data, numbers that have been results that I get by measurements and by standards. Okay. There are certain conclusions that we come up come out with these uh, from these examinations, come up with certain conclusions. There are certain fundamentals and rules that govern this idea, and there is some form of structure. Because we're not only playing around with the experiment in some place, but rather there's, a, there's some kind of formality, some kind of standardization. We're in a lab where certain measurements are used, okay? Certain scales, and these scales, some, sometimes they're universal, or we kind of define the scale before we apply the experiment, okay? So there's some kind of formalized study. It's not haphazard, it's not... Uh, qualitative, like experiences, but rather quantitative. Okay? These are the features that you guys have mentioned when it comes to science, right? I'll, I'll postpone my own view of what science is and then move on to the other topic, the other notion, which is knowledge. If this is science, this is the, the accumulation uh, of the word, of, of trying to define the word science according to you guys. If we try to define knowledge, what would knowledge be? Hmm. This is science. Okay? So what is knowledge? Anything of what you guys have mentioned before should not be repeated as itself. Huh? Correct? Otherwise, you'll be telling me that they're the same. Okay? They could overlap, uh, but if you want to define things in, a, in order to distinguish both of them, to understand where they separate, this is where we're talking about. Uh, so even those of you who believe that they overlap, or science is part of knowledge, or one is general and the other is specific, you have to tell me where they separate. Uh, what is in science, what is in knowledge that's different in science? Uh, 
What is knowledge? Yes, sir. Understanding. Understanding. Like any any kind of understanding is knowledge. Okay. Hmm. I don't get the word. I apologize. No specialization? No spe okay, so it's general. Okay. Understanding something through different aspects. Through different aspects and different views. Okay. So it has a wide it has a wide scope. Okay. Huh. Knowledge. Hmm. Why well, is this like only for me? You can let them hear as well. What do you say? The knowledge is knowledge. Uh, epistemology uh, means the theory of knowledge, how we acquire knowledge. Well, how we acquire something is different than what we acquire. Hmm. So, for example, one second, if, if you go shopping for and you want to buy groceries, groceries are one thing and shopping is another thing. Hmm. Uh, you're raising your hand. Yes, sir. Knowledge, uh, like you have uh, many information or overviews about uh, many aspects of subjects. Okay. But what? 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 <laughs> have information about okay. different subjects. Information about different subjects. Like when we say general knowledge, for example. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. It be an act of knowing through learning, through perceptions, through your his the act of knowing things. The act so of from uh, science, it's an accumulated established knowledge, which is a systemized form of... Uh, of knowledge? I would say knowledge, I would say hmm. a systemized form of information that is put down and taught and written. Okay, could you say that again, but a, a bit louder? Um, hmm. I would say um, science okay. is an accumulated and established fact. Okay. Which is uh, thought, which is formulated, is systemized, and put down in a book form or what, whatever that is being taught to. Okay. So science is some kind of accumulated, a, okay, accumulated information that is systemized and formulated and written down in books and taught. Okay. While knowledge. An act of knowing. Act of knowing. Which is gained to uh, reading, instruction, learning. Teaching experience. Okay, so pretty, I guess pretty much it, it boils down to act of knowing, right? Okay. Anybody else? This is an excellent attempt if I want. Any other? Knowledge. Yes, sir. Uh, it is the result of relationship between object and subject. What do you mean? Uh, object is the object of knowledge. Okay. What what is that relationship? <laughs> uh, when 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 subject uh, interact with uh, object and he it's the result of the interaction between a human and something. Okay, but perhaps the interaction between a human and something results in that the human loves that thing, not necessarily we would know it. <laughs> I mean that perhaps this is the this is the aria, this is the uh, the end result of relationships. <laughs> uh, huh. The subject as as the experiment. So uh, experiments again. So what's the difference between science and knowledge then? Uh, without any uh, system. So the only difference is that. Not if science applies some kind of a system in order to understand something, and knowledge does not use a system, right? Mm. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, science can't be false, but knowledge can. Science can't be false. But knowledge can. We can have this perception also. But mm. science can be proven and be right. Science can be proven. Knowledge can be proven. 
See, hold on one second. You're saying that knowledge could incorporate or include some kind of misconception. But, but science is a fact. And it can be proven, the fact. Then could it be otherwise? Could it be disproven? Huh? Could it be? I'm just asking. Maybe or yes. We're, we're practicing. We're practicing debate. Maybe or yes. Which one? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. If it can be proven, then it can be disproven as well. I mean, the, the worldview of Copernicus is different than uh, Newton, perhaps. Hmm. Okay, in your view, what do you think? In your view, I think that science is uh, what God Allah created. Is what? Allah already created. Okay. okay. The science is uh, how the, the world works. Okay, the science is about how the world works. And knowledge is our, um, our how we know, how we view. How we understand the world. Sometimes we can be wrong about what understand. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Any more attempts? Yes, sir. <coughs> Knowledge is a result of investigation and observation. What about science? The art of you said. Observation and investigation. No, go again. Because you said before that science is the art of knowing. And then you're saying that knowledge is investigation and... Yes. Science, uh, knowledge is uh, results of... Result out of... Is the art, uh, knowledge is yes. the result of science. Yes. Did you mean that? <laughs> <laughs> you're not Googling, are you? No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so, oh, that's something else. <laughs> okay, um, so what I, what I acquired from what you guys have, pro have provided in the answer to this question that perhaps knowledge, uh, that the general sentiment, the inclination that I find coming from you guys is that knowledge is generative. People tend to view that knowledge is general, yet sciences are always limited to a certain area of study. That knowledge is something that is general. Another understanding that people are thinking of knowledge as something uh, personal. There is some kind of individuality in the, in the meaning of knowledge, that a certain person acquires knowledge, yet science, as Mu'ad has has put is more systemized, for accumulated and formulated and taught. There's some kind of academic structure for it. So it involves more than one person. But knowledge, I sense that people are talking, you said the act of knowing. When, when, uh, perhaps I would uh, deduct from what you're saying that the act of knowing thus by a person, perhaps. Um, so knowledge is more, from, the, from what I understand from you guys, knowledge is more general. <laughs> Knowledge is something you get after you practice science. It is some kind of a result of the practicing of science. That knowledge is individual. When you talk and say knowledge, so it's a knowledge of a person. Yet science, we're talking about people and scientists and scholars and so forth. Um, this is what I get. Was there any other uh, ideas perhaps mentioned? Hmm. Yes, sir. Acquiring the reality of something. Knowledge is acquiring the reality of something. Then what is science? Superficial. Superficial, okay. Maybe uh, knowledge. Maybe knowledge is something which can be known as well. Knowledge is something that can be known. If I was to attribute something uh, to make it general. Okay. Because something, the act of knowing is more personal. So transition of that is to say something which can be known. Okay. Something 
think of the understanding of the Okay. Language. So when we... They would say in Arabic, Al-Salt al-Ilma bin Ma'loom. You say that al-Ilm, which is knowledge, you said that knowledge is what is known. Right? So there's Ilm and there's Ma'loom, the known. Shazam, did you finish what you were saying? Okay. See, this, uh, let's take one step, take it one step at, at a time. When we say science, there is a difference between science in the understanding of the post-enlightenment Western view, and there is science that is known in Arabic as Ayyub, okay? And we'll come to that. The post-enlightenment view of the word science, science is seen as, as you guys have mentioned, it's empirical. So it's the empirical studies of something. You, you exp there are experiments that are applied, as you guys have mentioned, that examines a certain phenomena in order to understand how the world works, how things operate, in order to understand how things are. So we seek the understanding of realities through quantitative experiments. Ex experiments that, that include observation, and these observations are based on, the, on what we can identify through our senses or aids for these senses, like uh, uh, certain equipments, for example, uh, telescopes, any kind of, any kind of equipment that are used in order to observe, okay? So either we observe directly by our senses, sensory capacities, or we observe through certain equipment or tools or utilities to get some kind of quantitative, measurable understanding of what's there. And these experiments are usually done through or these conclusions are usually uh, the result of the analysis of the observation. And what we analyze in the observations are the, ca the, the, the causal relationships. That when something happened, something else has happened. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a whole big argument between philosophers that there are difference between a causal relationship, mm -hmm. meaning like this. See when I when I struck when I strike like this with a pen, there is a sound. Okay. So you guys say that this sound is because my action like this. All right. Sometimes these relationships are not uh, together in this form. Mm -hmm. But something would happen and the result would appear after, you know, after time, or indirectly somehow. So what people do, they use this correlation. You understand that what a correlation is? Correlation, what's a correlation? Correlation like when something happens, another incident, another event happens at the same time or consequently like right directly after it. So some, the idea of correlation, they say in, in logic, correlation does not imply causation. If two things happen together, that does not necessitate that one of them is the cause of the other. Perhaps both of them are two effects of a different cause that you don't realize, that you don't observe. Okay? So coming back again, scientists, generally speaking, they study the world through exper experiments that are built and designed for a structured observation, and this observation is quantitative, it's numerical, it uses standards and measurements, and these me measurements, as I said, for observation, for what we observe, hmm? for things that we see, it's not rational deduction, it's not by syllogisms, it's not by rational, pure rational thinking. 
but rather from the analysis of what is observable, mm? something that is can be uh, can be sensed by the by, by the uh, human senses. All right. And as I said, this is a post-enlightenment spirit, because during the enlightenment in the West, there was a rejection, almost like a mass rejection, and I'm being kind of, I'm generalizing a little bit, but there was a, a, a tendency to reject this idea of metaphysics. You know what metaphysics are? Metaphysics, philosophy. Uh, they wanted to put philosophy aside, and I'm, uh, again, I am being, I am oversimplifying notions. They put philosophy aside, and what substitutes philosophy is quantitative study. The Greeks did not study the world through necessarily measurable, measurable experiments, through numbers, but rather through rational articulation, mm? through PS through logical syllogisms and rational thinking. But then, post the Enlightenment, the Western world shifted from having philosophy as the core uh, uh, structure for understanding the world to empirical sciences. If you examine physics at the time of Aristotle, and you examine physics post the Enlightenment, you find that physics during the times of the Greeks were more of a philosophical study. They would, under, they would try to understand when they say, for example, movement, or speed, or place, or time. They examine these questions without using lab experiments, but rather by articulation. Okay? So they don't apply experiments. Post-enlightenment, now time is studied in labs. For the, you know, uh, when you, for example, when you see astrophysics, science, astrophysicists, what they do is they do experiments, okay, to understand what time is, what space is, what time travel is all about. Is it true or not true? Is it possible or not possible? Hmm? All of these questions. So the the Western world moved from philosophy as a structure to understand the world to empirical sciences which they call sciences uh, as the medium to understand the world by experiments okay the quantitative analysis of observations and examinations very well this even happened to medicine medicine in the early stages of medicine, medicine used to apply a PS, rational thinking. Hmm? They saw experiments to, to be something that is... Uh, it was not celebrated or embraced. And then experiments were later on incorporated in, in medicine, in a point. So the definition that some of you had provided about science can be limited to a post-enlightenment understanding of what science is. Okay? Because if we say science is that, if we say science is numerical studies, examinations, experiments, labs, blah, 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 right? So, according to that, theology is not a science. Salimul Kalam is not a science. Jurisprudence is not a science. Law is not a science. Whether law is fiqh or law is uh, any kind of uh, uh, understanding of rules and uh, so, so any kind of uh, a legal system, okay? That would not be science. Political science would be ironic also. Unless politi uh, political scientists start using experiments to understand politics, then that would be something else. But before that, political science would be ironic. Because there are no lab experiments, there are no numerical observations or examinations. Social sciences, when we say sociology, then sociology, perhaps in some sense, would not be a science. Anthropology, the study of human cultures, would not be a science. Hmm? All philosophy and its branches, ethics, uh, uh, philosophy of religion, metaphysics, epistemology, as you said, theory of knowledge, all of that would not be considered to be science. 
all the, diff the different branches of religious sciences would not be science. And because of this, see, because of this understanding, or this type of approach, certain people, for example, this guy that appeared on an Egyptian channel and started saying, Ilm al Hadith is not a science. He said, Ilm al Hadith is not a ilm. He said that. Hmm? I could have said his name if I wanted to. So, when he said, Ilm al Hadith is not a ilm. Because there are no lab experiments. That is based on a post-enlightenment approach. Is that approach correct or not? Before we say it, whether it's correct or not, you have to understand something. That the difference in understanding what science is, all of this we're doing an introduction for Mimul Ghazali, so just bear with me. All of this is because of Epistemology. Epistemology means theory of knowledge. In other words, how do humans come about to understand and to, rea to realize the world? How do we realize the, wor the world? Hmm? How do we come about to know something rather than not knowing something? So people start talking about the different sources from which we acquire knowledge. Okay? So some people say that we acquire knowledge by our senses. We see things. Okay? We hear things. We taste. We smell. We touch. Okay? So these acts of observation provide us with some kind of realization of what the world is. This is one type. Another type is that we think about the world. We articulate ideas. We use al-aql, we use reason, we use the intellect to come about understand, the understanding of the world. So this is another source. Those who believe in religious revelations, in a shalaya, they believe that al-wahi is a source of understanding and realizing what, what the world is all about. Okay? And how do we get al wahi How do we come in contact with, with al wahi Either we meet a prophet, may Allah be pleased and peace be upon all prophets, or that we get certain narrations, riwayat, hmm? that chains of narrations that connect us with, with these prophets if we don't, if we're not existent during the time, during their times, okay? So there, generally speaking, there are three divisions, either the, the senses, al-his, or al-aq, reason, or al-sam, by listening to different narrations, or listening to al-wahi itself, okay? Either you receive it directly from a prophet, or mm, you are being told through certain narrations that the Prophet, or that our Prophet has said so and so. Okay? And as sama this idea of narration, is not limited to religious revelations. It's applied in history as well. Hmm? History is based on witnesses and narrations and so forth. Okay? So these are three types of knowledge. And perhaps a set of Sufiya, the Sufis would say that a source of knowledge is coming in contact with the revelation on a spiritual level that they call Al Kashf, for example. Okay? So these then would be four types of knowledge. The post enlightenment understanding of what knowledge, of, of what science is all about is rooted in their, under, in their views of epistemology, of the sources of knowledge. They began to reject that the, that, al -aql, that the intellect is a source of understanding the world. But rather, the world is understood 
through observations. Okay? This stance, this position, this understanding is, a, is in itself a philosophical position. Because they did not come about with this conclusion by observation. You understand? That they did not conclude, they did not do some kind of experiment where they all got together hmm, and they observed that al-aql is not useful, is not beneficial, but rather only observations that give us correct understanding and true understanding of what the, of what the world is all about. They did not do that. Hmm? But rather, they defended their position through philosophy. Kant has done this, and for example, hmm, when he was attacking pure reason. All right, he has done that through philosophy, through some kind of philosophizing, this idea. Okay. So, because their position in epistemology resulted that they confined, confined means what? Limit. Huh? Confined is like being jailed in a, in a prison cell. They confined the understanding of science to only the studies that are based on empirical data and experimental observations. Fine? So, if I ask you again, what is science? Your answer could change. Because so far, see, the, the, because of globalization, many of, pe of the people in the East are calling or are limiting science, and their understanding of science, because the West is also viewing science as such. And then you would find in universities, they differentiate between science and liberal arts, for example. Okay? where humanities and social sciences and philosophy are being taught. So all the areas of linguistics, certain areas of linguistics go to empirical sciences. When they merge linguistics with psychology, for example. But generally speaking, language, literature, philosophy, social sciences are types of liberal arts. And on the other hand, those who study science and those who study physics, chemistry, biology, uh, uh, liberal arts will also involve law and history. These are liberal arts. And on the other hand, all the different types of uh, empirical sciences are called science. And then you would have certain, certain areas that are, you know, they move back and forth. Until this very day, the West did not, do not, did not, until this very day, they did not agree if economics, science, or a liberal art. Until this very day, there is a, a debate, a contention. Huh? Is econ economics, should it be considered as a science? Like, should we treat economics like physics and chemistry and astrophysics? Or should we treat economics like we treat philosophy and political science and history and literature? Which one? Until this very day, they have this kind of contention when it comes to economics. If this is what the West provides for science, what, do, what does the East provide? How do we view science to be all about? Our answer will depend on how we view the sources of knowledge. If we don't limit knowledge to the senses, if we say that al-aql is a source of knowledge, if we say that as narrations are a source of knowledge, and religious revelations are a source of knowledge, then our understanding of what science is would differ. So you would find, you would find Muslim scholars, they, call it, they say, ilm al-hadith. There is observation, by the way, in al-hadith, and examination, and some kind of induction. Perhaps not necessarily quantitative, numerical, but there is some kind of istiqab in al-hadith. 
you will say they, they say ilm al the science of language. So they say the science, even though it's based on narration and it's based on the aql. And it's not based necessarily on the senses, even though unless you would say that listening to certain dialects and certain pronunciation and so on, that would be observation. But there are no lab experiments in language. They would say the science of history. They say the science of the principles of legal jurisprudence or Islamic jurisprudence. So they used to say that these are sciences. If this is their understanding, then how can we define science according to them? I guess the closest answer would be Mu'ad's answer when he was talking about that it is a some kind of standardized formulation and, 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 and a cumulative formulation as well of a set of information, of data uh, that are studied over time. This type of structure would involve what Sheikh Allah has said, this idea of rules and fundamentals. Because when you say structure, any kind of structure, any kind of structure, must have certain cornerstones, certain rules, principles, uh, general layouts. The, the main ideas in an outline is to constitute the, the structure. Even physical objects, they have a structure. We have a skeleton. So sciences as well, they have that skeleton. They have these principles and rules, general rules. They would also involve some kind of nomenclature, terminologies, jargon, what we call in Arabic, islah or mustalahat. So they have their own terminologies. They would also involve what you said as objects. Mawdur uh, al is the object. And uh, the object of sciences is pretty much like the grouping of certain information into clusters and chunks. Okay, so what, what is pertaining the narrations of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, we call that ilm al hadith. What is related to the verses of the Quran, we call that ilm al tafsir. So we get different types of religious information and we put them in certain clusters and chunks. And we give each cluster, each chunk, and each group a certain title. And scholars who study this information in, in a formulated, standardized form, they have these terminologies, mustalahat. So you find ulama al hadith, the sciences of, the scholars of hadith, they would say hadith al sahih, they would say hadith al muallaq, they would say hadith al mursal, and ulama al tafsir, they would have their own terminologies, and then ulama al usul, they would have their own terminologies, and so on. Then we, then this would be on our understanding of of al -ilm. Group of information clustered or chunked according to a certain object. And they're studied in a, in a certain standard, standardized form. And it would involve books, as Mu'ayyad said, sciences, must involve some kind of a medium to study them. Hmm. Knowledge, perhaps, can be acquired by narration, and we'll come to that, by mere individualistic observation. Like children, they acquire knowledge by seeing their parents, how they act. So they get to know things from only observing them. But sciences, when we say science, we'll usually think of academia. We think of books, teachers, and students. And they involve a certain structure, some kind of, of structure. They could differ from one culture to another, a society to another, language to another, from one time to another. But there are usually some kind that dissemination, the spread of science, must acquire some kind of standard setting. Okay? They usually also involve some kind of a license, a certificate, an ijaza. Hmm? They usually involve stages and levels. This is when we come to talk about sciences. When we move to knowledge, 
It's a bit different than what science is, is about. Science, according to our definition that we just mentioned, is somewhat limited. Limited to what? To the study. Right? To what, to what the study is. Because we say the study of hadith, then we understand that this is not tafsir. We automatically understand that this is not usul. It's not tip, it's not medicine. And medicine is not physics. But when you say knowledge, knowledge does not pertain, necessarily does not pertain a certain area. And knowledge, when you say in Arabic, علم, which is knowledge, the noun knowledge, the, it refers to different meanings. One of them, it refers to the, as Mu'ad has said, المعلوم, what is known. Meaning knowledge is the specific information that we have acquired. You say, I acquired knowledge. So I acquired some I acquired something. Right? I acquired, I got, uh, I have knowledge, he has knowledge. Uh, so we mean that he has the understanding of these things. Okay? So we refer we use the word the noun knowledge, we use the word ilm, and we mean al ma'loom, we mean the known. Okay? But this is not knowledge in itself. This is what is the known. Okay? Like for example, when you say to a person, I know you have a book. Okay? So you have a knowledge that that person has a book. Alright? So you say you have knowledge, what do we mean by knowledge here? The fact, uh, the knowing that this person has a book. Okay? So this is one type when you say knowledge. Sometimes we say knowledge and we mean the information of sciences. The matters of sciences, the questions and problems of sciences. We call it aim. So here, aim could be uh, knowledge in this sense could be equivalent to science in Arabic. Because when we say aim al hadith, when we say aim al hadith, what do we mean by aim al hadith? Either we mean the notions, the ideas, the information discussed in that field of study called Ilm al Hadith. Or we mean understanding these notions. Idraq al Masad. That is called knowledge. He has the knowledge of Hadith, meaning he understands the ideas and notions and matters of Ilm al Hadith. So this is another meaning. Or, when we say, for example, this person, عالم حديث, he is a scholar of hadith. Or we say, he has علم الحديث, فهو عالم, so he's a, he's a scholar. And what we mean by that, we mean the capacity of understanding these notions. So it's not simple understanding, but rather deep understanding, where he encompasses different views and different sides of the of this information of Ilm al-Hadith. So it's not the, the mere understanding. Okay? So the word Ilm is sometimes sometimes refers to the what is known. Sometimes would mean the science, would be equivalent to a science or the matters of the science. Sometimes you would refer to it would refer to the understanding of these matters, the knowing of these matters, the realization of these matters. And then the fourth under, uh, the fourth, the fourth uh, usage for the word knowledge would mean the capacity of a certain science, meaning the scholarship of that science. Mm. And then there is a fifth and perhaps final that when you say knowledge as a as a trait, as an attribute, as a mindset. See, because knowledge is a human attribute. When we say, for example, 
without identifying the signs, without identifying the area. When you say, Mu'ad Alim. Hmm? So, if we said Mu'adun Alim, therefore, he has some kind of attribute. We describe Mu'ad by knowledge. Knowledge is then a description of his personality. Like when you say a person is tall, a person is short, a person is knowledgeable. So knowledge becomes his attribute. Okay? In other words, he has developed some kind of mindset of understanding. If we wanted to say, okay, if a person is alim, a person is knowledgeable, what is that act of knowing? A good word that has been used is to realize. To know is to realize. That as the, the, the object of your knowing becomes real to you. Another attempt to describe what knowledge is as an attribute, it's a revealing trait. Trait is a, something that you do, hmm? almost the same meaning like a characteristic. A person who has knowledge, what we mean is that there is something that has been revealed for him. He has comprehended something. Okay. Do we now distinguish between what science is and what knowledge is? If we understand what science is, then we come back to knowledge. Knowledge could be a result of science. But knowledge is not limited to sciences. Okay? Sciences are standardized way of examining certain phenomena. Knowledge is more universal, it's more holistic. Mm? And, uh, yes, well, sciences are comprehensive as well. But it's, it, it, that sciences usually approach a certain phenomenon. But knowledge can be holistic. And a person could be knowledgeable, but not necessarily a scholar in a certain science. But yet he has, or she, she has the, the knowledge. Now we move on, after we give this long introduction, we move on to the words of Imam Ghazali Because people treat Ihya or Ulum al-Din, see, we've said that this past hour, uh, we have been discussing this idea of knowledge and science, so when we come to the Ihya or Ulum al-Din, when we come to the Kitab al the Book of Knowledge, or is it the book of science? See? This is why we needed this whole introduction. Because when we read the title, Kitab al what did he mean? Did he mean knowledge? Or did he mean science? And if he meant knowledge, which one of the five alternatives that we have for the word knowledge? See? And then when he said, when he attributes ulum to the religion, Religious sciences, okay? So these sci sciences of the religion, or is it knowledge of the religion? Okay? In short, in short, and then I'll take, I'll, yeah, I'll, this time I'll give you the conclusion to begin with. Imam al-Ghazali, the correct translate, if, if I would translate it, I would, but unfortunately it has been known now, the, the revival of religious sciences. So if you change the name, perhaps people would, you know, would ask you, if, do you mean the book of Imam Ghazali or not? I would choose the revival of religious knowledge, not religious sciences. Imam al-Ghazali, 
wanted to do wanted to distinguish two realities. One of them is the phenomenon of Islam as a religion. Experienced and lived and practiced uh, and revived by generation after generation. Okay? He wanted to put on one hand Islam, the religion of Islam as a phenomenon, lived and practiced and acquired uh, generation after generation. And on the other hand, the standardized academic study of different aspects of this phenomenon. Again, so there is the religion of Islam as a reality, something called religion. Huh? Deenul Islam. Deenul, when we say Deenul Islam, it's not a science. The Prophet uh, was not sent to the world with a science called Islam or a group of sciences, of Islamic sciences. He was sent with something called religion, deen. Okay? So Al-Imam al-Ghazali wants to revive the knowledge of this deen, not the sciences that try to understand this phenomenon called deen al-Islam from different aspects. Because ilm al-tafsir did what? Went to the verses of the Qur'an, which is not Islam. It's part of the phenomenon. That is the verses of the Qur'an. And they wanted to study, to systematically study, and to put this phenomenon in an academic structure. To examine it academically. So they did something called the Ilm al-Tafsir. And on another, uh, on another level, they did that with Ilm al-Hadith. They, they did that as well with Ilm al-Fiqh. They did that with Ulum that are related, like Ilm al -Lugan. They are not religious sciences, but they are related. Okay? One could say, one of you could think about something that is, but part of this phenomenon, Islam, that companions like Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas would sit in a majlis and explain the verses of the Quran. Would that be ilm tafsir like the science of tafsir? Was Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas doing the science of tafsir? Or was he doing the knowledge of tafsir? See? This is the root. Sciences evolve, evolve, they come about, they are developed huh? from the dissemination, dissemination is spread, of acquired knowledge in a certain society. So tafsir in the, in the lives of the Sahaba was not an academic class. Okay? Was not necessarily an academic class. But rather it was a way to, communi to communicate their understanding of the religion. They were only communicating their understanding. It wasn't a systematic structure of a study, of examination. But they were rather communicating their own understanding of this aspect of the religion. Okay? By time, certain people attended, attended the lessons of tafsir by Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas. Others would attend the judgments and would, would, would be present during the uh, the court judgments by Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab or Sayyidina Ali Abi Talib So they would move to the idea of jurisprudence. Okay? 
And these groups, different groups, all the pious predecessors, some of them acquired tafsir, others acquired fiqh, others acquired different types of knowledge. And they began themselves, they want to do the same thing as Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas wanted to do, communicate. Then they needed, in order to preserve and to guarantee the continuation, they needed to use certain terminologies. So their knowledge acquired in the area of tafsir would not be mixed up with, their, with other people's knowledge that are coming from the areas of fiqh and so on. So terminology is developed, okay? And structures, and then you began having lessons and books and so on. So sciences, religious sciences, evolved from the dissemination of religious knowledge, okay? In other words, the Sahaba did not necessarily like have, like, like we have now schools, okay? And then the teacher of the course on Tafsir is Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, and then you have Tafsir 101, and Tafsir 102, and then undergraduates, and grad they did not have that. It was more of, they, had, they viewed that they had the responsibility of communicating Islam to the public, to the masses. And the Sahaba, each one of them is not the Prophet ﷺ, but rather has a certain trait that he or she acquired from the Prophet ﷺ. That I, I would see the companions of Allah are different images of the Prophet ﷺ. But each one of them is not all the images. There's only one or two or few images of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Sahaba are صُورٌ مُتَعَدِّدَةٌ لِلنَّبِيِّ عَلَيْهِ Various images of the Prophet ﷺ, the various reflections of the personality and the character of the Prophet ﷺ. So each one went on to communicate what he acquired or she has acquired. And the continuation of this, because societies were then, were becoming into cities, urban cities, after the expansion of the Muslim empire, that, and after the translation of different heritage and traditions of the world, those who were acquiring the communicated knowledge of religion found that it is necessary that they begin to standardize the knowledge. So knowledge began to evolve into sciences. Imam al-Ghazali, what is he concerned about? That when this transition happened, that knowledge began to become sciences, that people forget what knowledge is all about. Hmm. Knowledge began, began turned into a science. So Imam Ghazali wants, wants to tell people, hold on. Sciences move on in, in, the, in the academic track, but the general public need to have the knowledge of salah, knowledge of siyam, knowledge of zakat, not necessarily the fiqh of these. Hmm. Because the fiqh of these is a study of these. He does not mean that. He does not mean that the person would um, explain the different arcan, different conditions and principles, and would lay out the academic understanding of what salah is, the legal understanding of what's a valid salah and what's an invalid salah. This is not the religious knowledge. According to Imam Ghazali, this is a scientific knowledge of what salah is. What Imam Ghazali would mean that the knowledge of this salah becomes a trait of the person. That when you say, he knows how to pray. Not that he knows what praying is. So Imam Ghazali differentiates between these two. A person who knows what praying is, who can explain what is that act in some kind of academic articulation. Hmm? Definitions, ordered form, Invalid, invalid, examinations, studies, conditions, principles, fundamentals, uh, deduction, proofs, the verses, the hadith. This is scientific knowledge. 
And then a person who puts this, uh, or he, who understands what praying is as the phenomena of praying that is part of the general phenomena of Islam. Islam has Islam as a religion, not as a science, had an act called prayer. And I understand that the person would have the understanding of what prayer is in accordance to the religion, not to the science of him. He wants to... Okay, go ahead. So is it wrong to say the revival of religious sciences? In some sense it could be wrong. Yes. In some sense it could be wrong. Because Imam Ghazali is not trying to revive nomenclature, terminologies, or anything of that sort. That's why I said in some sense. In some sense, it's wrong because Imam Ghazali wants people to, dis to distinguish and to acquire religious knowledge and not to mix up the different, uh, the different things. Because he, he began to realize that people think that the ilm al kalam is faith. People are be beginning to think that the ilm al fiqh is the practice of a sharia. You get the point? He's saying these are studies, but not the practice. And the knowledge acquired from practice is different than the knowledge acquired from studies. And then I'm coming, I know where you're getting at. Because by doing so, Imam al Ghazali himself is then structuring the religious knowledge. Is this what you want to say? Yes or no? Look, we, we can come to conclude that Imam Ghazali did not mean sciences by only viewing the outline. Right? There, I mean, do you guys find reviving ilm usul fiqh, reviving ilm hadith, reviving ilm tafsir? The four quarters are talking about what? Ibadat, worship. Adat, the habits and, and daily routines. And then and you will look at mischief and sins, and then you will talk about salvation, where he talks about repentance. These are the four quarters. Where are the sciences? Did he say one quarter for ilm tafsir, another for ilm hadith, another for ilm al fiqh, another? No. So it's obvious that he did not mean sciences to me, only from the outline. We can conclude after this that there is a there are three different things. They are all related though. Religion, religious sciences, religiosity. Deen, ulum al-deen, al-tadayun. Three different things. Al-tadayun is the knowledge and the practice and the knowledge of, of the religion. So religion, if studied if practiced and, and the person is developing the mindset and the knowledge that is the result of the practice of this religion is called tadayun, being religious, religiosity. Imam al Ghazali was concerned that people mix between religious sciences and religiosity. We see, I, I guess I talked to you guys about this notion before. You find Orientalists are studying fiqh. Who are, not, uh, who are not Muslims. They study fiqh. And perhaps they would understand fiqh than laymen, lay Muslims. They would understand fiqh more than them. But that's the study of the phenomenon, not the practice. Okay? Imam al Ghazali wanted to, to transmit and to communicate these ideas to the fuqaha, to the jurists, and to ulama al the theologians of his time. 
But this is a very difficult uh, job because you're going to the scholars of fiqh and you're telling them, look, you don't have the knowledge of the religion. You have the knowledge of the science of the religion, of a science of the, of the uh, religious sciences. So in order for, for him to take him to take them for, to this conclusion, he does that in a very gradual, slow steps. The first step that he takes is doing a legal approach. Okay? Because they're jurists, fuqaha, so they would understand the language of fiqh. So he, he, the first step that he talks about, what is knowledge that is mandatory, fardu'ayn, on every single individual? And what is knowledge that is mandatory, but fardu kifayah, on the collectiveness of the society, on the psyche as a whole? So there are responsibilities that each single individual have to carry out, and there are other responsibilities that the Muslim society, in total, have to come together and produce this act. Okay? Whether all of them get together and uh, uh, perhaps work on, on accomplishing it, or a certain group out of the society, or certain individuals that accomplish this required task. So this is the first step that Imam al-Ghazali does. Let's talk about what is the knowledge that is fardu'ayn. And I want you to know here. Imam al-Ghazali is saying this. There is some kind of religious understanding that every single individual must know. So when he says this, al fuqaha of course, is, you know, is excited about this idea. Let's, you know, he is discussing a fiqh matter. He's saying, what is mandatory? What is a must? What is an obligation? What are the knowledge, what are the types of information or kinds of, of information that every single individual Muslim must know? And what are the understandings that, a mu Muslim, that should be present in a Muslim society? Not necessarily that every single Muslim would know, but the Muslim society in general should involve some kind of people that would understand these ideas and topics. So this is what he starts section 2 with. And he does this by giving an introduction. Imam al-Azali begins the section by saying, look, The Prophet said that seeking knowledge is an ordinance obligatory on every Muslim. Okay, it's a must that every Muslim seeks knowledge. So he's asking, how do we define the knowledge that, that is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet? He said, theologians would say theology is what is what the Prophet has meant. Jur jurists would say jurisprudence. The Prophet said, then he means the fiqh. Those would say ilmu usul al-din or ilmu al-kalam. And others, ulama al-hadith would say that as well. Ulama al-tafsir would say that as well. And also the Sufis would say that this is the knowledge that a person would know. So he said, in order to understand, see again, this is, the this is the character of Imam al-Azali. Imam al-Azali understands sectarianism. He understands different sects and groups. And he understands that different opinions arrive when we use terminologies. When we say ilm al-kalam, fiqh, tasawwu. Huh? Different groups emerge. So what do we do? Let's move back to the hadith and forget about all these different groups. Acquiring knowledge is a must. Let's discuss what is the information that is required. Let's discuss it. Let's think about it. What is the Prophet mean? What did he mean? Because back then, there was no fiqh, there was no theology, there was no tasawwuf as a field, as an area. 
All these things were not, were not there as structures, as separated areas. So let's think, what did the Prophet ﷺ mean by that? And he also gave examples how different scholars would mean different things by the mandatory knowledge, how, and he gave an example, and this is just very smart of him, you find him in the, in the first paragraph in page 24, because the page 24 starts by the remainder of a paragraph that started on page 23. And then he says on page 24, according to Abu Talib in Mecca, what is meant by the above mentioned tradition is knowledge of the contents of tradition which embodies the foundations of Islam referred in the following words of the Prophet Islam is built upon five pillars. Bunya Islam ala khamsa. You know why he got this particular quote? Why is he quoting Abu Talib in Mecca? Because Imam Abu Talib al-Makki, the author of Qut al was a Sufi scholar. And he's bringing forth, bringing forward the explanation of the hadith, the explanation by a Sufi. And the Sufi was not saying what? See, Abu Talib al-Makki is not saying that the mandatory knowledge is Sufism. He did not say that. He said the mandatory knowledge is the knowledge of al arkan al khams the five principles. And jurists would not reject that, this kind of understanding. So it's as if Imam Ghazali, I hope he uh, forgives me for doing this, but I'm trying to simplify for the, for the modern age. You know, after he says this, he looks to the jurists and goes like, wink, wink. See? He's a Sufi and he's saying the the five fundamentals. We're not so different. This is very smart of him. And indirectly as well, he's giving you something to the reader when you read this. See, when, when you come to, when you're reading a book of Torah and you find the scholar quotes and not one, one person, you immediately make a note to yourself that this particular scholar, for example, Sidi Abu Talib Mecki, is one of the sources which Imam al Ghazali used to write his book. You, you, you should do that conclusion, it's almost 100%. Because sometimes there are only, uh, you know, singled out quotes. Sometimes. But other times, when he quote, when the scholar quotes another in a book, sometimes it's an indication that he used the words of that other scholar as a source. This is their type of citation. See, Imam al-Ghazali, after he finished the Hiya'ul Din, he did not have an appendix at the end where he puts bibliography. He did not do that. But he would indicate to the reader by these hints. Okay? And then he makes a conclusion. He says, after he quotes Sidi Abu Khalid Mecki, he says, since these five pillars are ordinances imposed by God. It is necessary to know how to fulfill them. If we say that these five pillars are mandatory, then, therefore, it is mandatory to know them, because how could you practice them if you don't know them? And then he says, the student, therefore, should be absolutely certain that knowledge, as we have already shown in the introduction to this book, is divided into the science of practical, practical religion and the science of revelations. The scope of, of this discussion is, is confined to the science of practical religion. What he means by science of revelation, in Arabic he uses the two terms, ilmul mu'amala wa ilmul mukashafa. Ilm al mu'amala, what he means, the practical, what, is, what he, the translator has said, practical religion. Ilm al mu'amala, how do you uh, de 
reveal or how how do you perform your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your relationship with al khalq hmm? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or kayfa tu'amil al khalq How do you deal, how do you perform this the, 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 the duties and the tasks of the relationship between the, the, create, the, the creature and the creator and between the creatures of, within themselves. Hmm? And on the other hand, the ilmul mukashafa, what he says as the science of revelation, this should be the knowledge of revelation. Because when we say ilmul mukashafa, are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the addition of knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal, whether according, whether through angels or whether through dreams or any other methods, the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to the saints, for example, to al awliya And then he says, what we are discussing in this book is ilmul mu'amala, is the practical aspects. And here he is also again, he's saying to the jurists that Sufism is not only about this revealed knowledge, but Sufism is also about the spirit of the practice. Hmm? That both Sufis and jurists, both of them together, are concerned about the practice of the religion. And then he, want, and then he will move on to differentiate.